All right, well, it's 12.01, so why don't we get started? Uh, so my name is Frank Fukuyama. I'm the Mossbacker Director of Center on Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law, and I'm really extremely pleased to be able to launch a new book uh, by Steve Krasner. Uh, the book is provocatively titled Making Love to a Dictator. I think it's uh, provocative in a Center for Democracy, Development and the Rule of Law, uh, but I think that Steve uh, has never shied away from controversy and um, uh, previous writings, but we're really delighted to uh, welcome him today. So Steve is the Graham H. Stewart Professor of International Relations and a professor in the Political Science Department here at Stanford. He had been the Senior Associate Dean for the Social Sciences uh, School of Humanities and Sciences. He was the Deputy Director of FSI. He hold, held uh, my position as Director of CDDRL uh, and is also a FSI and a Hoover uh, Senior Fellow. Uh, from 2005 to 2007, he served as the director of the policy planning staff for the U.S. Department of State uh, under Condoleezza Rice. He worked at that time on uh, matters of foreign assistance reform uh, in the wake of the interventions in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, um, and well, I should say, uh, he was actually my professor. He taught me my basic course in international relations theory when I was still a graduate student in the Harvard government department, but has written some absolutely foundational books within um, the field of international relations, particularly uh, on uh, the question of sovereignty. Uh, and I'm quite familiar with the current book that he's introducing uh, today. When um, I first came to Stanford in the early 2000s, uh, Steve had organized a uh, little seminar with Carl Eikenberry on the question of state building that revolved around what we were doing or thought we were doing in places like uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. And I'm really very pleased to see that it's developed into uh, the book that you have uh, before you. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Steve. Uh, he'll talk for maybe half an hour and then uh, we will open the floor to a Q&A. So Steve, uh, take it away. So Frank, thanks very much for that introduction and thanks so much for having me. I, I, I'm sure that most of the people uh, watching this will, will see that the perspective that I have is very different than the perspective that's uh, held by most of the scholars at CDDRL. Uh, what I really tried to do in this book was to apply recent theories of state development and state building um, to what we might expect we could do if we're external state builders. So I thought I'd begin this, is, and I've tried to summarize this in a book that's going to come out early next month. Um, uh, I see, so the best laid plans of mice and men. So this is, my screen is not moving. So I should, I can try and tell you this. Let's see if this works. Um, Frank, this is not, it's still on you or is it on me? No, it's on, well, I can see your slide. Yeah, so, so I, can't, just... I can't move the slide though. Dee Dee, let's say we can move the slides, we can do that. that so the book is called How to Make Love to a Despot. Uh, it will be published by Liveride in, early next month, early in May. Um, Didi, I'm not able to move my slides, um, so it's stuck on the first side. So let me say a Didi, little bit. Do you want to? Do you want to? Do you want to? Why don't you stop the um, sharing and then let Didi share? You don't have to do that. Move your cursor uh, up to the top of the screen and. Dad, let me see if I share my screen. No, you're sharing oh. right now. So move your cursor up to the top of the screen and. There should be a red button that will say stop sharing. Uh, it's not in the stop. So there's something that says share screen. I'm on, yep. it looks like I'm on chat. No, go up to the top of the screen. And if you move your cursor up there, there'll be a button that will say stop sharing. Uh, yeah, okay, there, you did it. All right, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully we'll be able to see the slides. Is this working? Yes, I don't know. It's working. I don't yeah. know whether it's okay, working. There you go. 
Okay, I'm going to play these slides. So if you get it, get in the, the book cover, that would be great. The next slide. So now I'm seeing development theories and external state building. Now I'm seeing the second slide. So this is the cover of the book. Um, as I said, the book will be published by Liberite, which is an imprint of Norton, early next month, early in May. All right, basically, I think the starting point here is to recognize that if we go to the next slide, please, that very few states have made it into the OECD world. That is a world where we have consolidated democracy and we also have economic wealth. Um, if we look at most of human history and we look at most parts of the world, states have been exclusive, close access, rent seeking, exploitative, and violent. That's the kind of states that most states have, that most states have lived under. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, if you look at the trajectory of GNP per capita, I mean, what you see in this chart is that there are a few states that have become very wealthy, mainly in Western Europe and North America, and to some extent in East Asia. Most states have stayed at pretty low per capita incomes. Um, you know, if you think about this, I mean, I think there's a, the standard explanation in economics would be that if you have a state which is all powerful, um, people won't make investments. They won't make material investments. They won't make immaterial investments. They won't spend a lot of years at university. They'll put their money into things that they can move easily. One explanation for why uh, real estate prices in Palo Alto are so high. Lots of Chinese are buying. So that you, you know, getting to a place where a state was both effective and also constrained is actually extremely hard to do. And it's only happened in a very few places in the world. And I think there's a very good reason for that. The kind of iconic story is a story about China in the 15th century where the Chinese had, the Chinese tre treasure fleet had ships that were larger than any of the ships, any boats that were uh, possessed by the West, by the Portuguese at that point, um, that had larger crews. The emperor of China decided that the treasure fleet was a threat to his rule, recalled the treasure fleet, burned it, and allowed trading to take place only along the coast of China. If you could go to the next slide, please. Um, so if we think about, um, I mean, this is the big question in social science. Why have we had development? And I think the first two of these theories are very familiar and are really the perspectives that are held by most people in the United States, including most policymakers in the United States, although they wouldn't necessarily give this a label. So the first is modernization theory. The second is the theory about institutional capacity. I think both of these are quite familiar people. The third is the theory of elite competition and bargaining, which is where I'm making my bets and which has very negative implications for what external state builders can do next. So I'll, go, I'll try to go through each of these um, and then explain what their implications are for external state building. So next slide, please. Um, if you look at modernization theory, it basically, I mean, here was, here was Marx or even Weber who came somewhat later. I mean, here's Marx sitting in England in the 19th century, seeing the Industrial Revolution, you know, wondering what's going on, seeing a lot of misery around him. Um, there were clearly a lot of people that were leaving the countryside and coming to major cities. That uh, They might have been paid more money, they might have been forced off their land, they were clearly living in, in, in very bad conditions. But if you look at modernization, what modernization theory basically says is that if you have technological change and you have population growth, um, you will eventually get a larger middle class. A larger middle class will prevent, will be the basis for consolidated democracy and basically all good things go together. So if you can just get yourself started on the lower rung of the escalator, the escalator is going to take you all the way off. You'll be like this happy couple. All good things will go together and the escalator will keep going up. And so if you look, for instance, at this target of 0.7% of aid for developing countries, which was something that was developed in the 1960s by Pearson, who was the Prime Minister of Canada, it really is based on modernization theory. So modernization theory basically says that all good things go together, and if you could just find your way onto the bottom step, if you can just get enough, aid, enough foreign assistance, get enough capital to make the necessary investments, you'll have growth, you'll have a larger middle class, and eventually you'll have democracy. Next slide, please. So there is certainly a lot of, next slide, 
if you could. If you look at um, uh, the empirical evidence for this approach, um, there's certainly a lot of support for it. So if you look at the period from 1800 to the year 2000, there is a strong overall relationship uh, between per capita income and democracy. Um, the big exception is the period during the Cold War when both the Soviet Union and the United States were more interested in having allies than they were interested in um, economic growth and democratization, regardless of what they said. Um, uh, if you look at countries that are wealthy, if they actually do succeed in making the transition to democracy, they're likely to stay democratic. And countries that are relatively poor, if they make the transition, um, are likely to fall back. So there's a lot of switching between autocratic and democratic regimes from autocratic to democratic and back from democratic to autocratic. Um, it's much more likely that you're going to stay democratic if you're, if you're wealthy um, than if you're poor. However, there's also some empirical evidence which is inconsistent with the theory. Um, it isn't clear, if you don't make the transition to democracy, it's not, necessarily, it's not necessarily the case that if you have a higher income, that it's more likely that you will make this transition. So think about China. It's possible that, you know, from the empirical evidence that we have, that China would be very wealthy um, and will remain an autocratic regime. And if you look at the length of time of autocratic regimes, um, there's not a strong relationship with income. So that getting a higher income does not automatically mean become a democratic regime. You might or you might not. In my view, a lot of this depends upon luck. Um, but um, if you do make the transition, that's great, but you won't necessarily make the transition. So we, we do have a lot of evidence that supports modernization theory, but not all of the evidence that we have supports modernization theory. Even though I think if you look at most public policy in the United States or internationally, most of it's been based on modernization theory. So if we go on to the next approach, which is institutional capacity, there are things can go up, but they can also go down. Uh, if you look at Huntington, uh, maybe Fukuyama, although Frank doesn't like necessarily being put in this box. And basically this is an argument that says, if you have social mobilization, so people move to the cities and they become better educated, that unless that's accompanied by institutional development, you will okay, you will fall back down into an order of So things don't automatically keep going up. You can get on the, uh, on the bottom rung of the escalator, you can go up part of the way and then you could fall back down if you don't develop automatic institutional capacity. And this, I mean, this is an argument that has been around for a long time. If you look at Hobbes in the 17th century, when you wrote Leviathan in the middle of the, or right at the end of the English Civil Wars, Hobbes was very concerned about order breaking down. Certainly Huntington in the 1960s, who was a political scientist at Harvard University, was very interested in having institutional capacity. If you don't have institutional capacity of chaos, if you have chaos, you will not have economic growth. So the escalator can go up, but the escalator might also go down. That's the, an institutional capacity argument. Next slide, please. So the, it raises an obvious question. Next slide, if you could. I mean, where does institutional capacity come from? Go back one, if you would. Um, so the most common order is war makes the state and state makes war. This is an argument that's associated with Tilly, who was an, um, an historical sociologist in Colombia. Um, and it's true that if you look at European states, they become consolidated between the 16th and the 20th century. Uh, if you look at this illustration at the bottom of the page, it's the first illustration that we have, the first picture that we have of a human being. It's a king of Egypt, King Ben, and we can see that he's clubbing someone probably to death. So, most of the time, the state makes war and, the, and war makes the state. That's the most common argument that we have. If you have some external threat, um, if you don't develop a strong state, which requires both coercion and coercion, I mean, coercive capacity usually requires getting con some consolidation of capital. You're not going to be able to defend yourself, but you can't defend yourself. You'll be overrun. If you're overrun, that's likely to be a very bad thing. There are also a bunch of other arguments since it looks like this argument about, about war makes the state and the state makes war is not a very compelling argument if you're looking at the contemporary period. So next slide, please. Um, there are also a series of others. So there's a, there are some arguments about social coalitions. 
leading to greater institutional capacity. That's certainly the favorite explanation for the United States after the Civil War in the United States. If you look at the end of the 19th century, state capacity grew considerably. Um, the argument is that this was mainly the result of social coalitions, which switched demands on the state for railways, universities, eventually roads, other things. And there are certainly other arguments in early modern Europe or even modern day Somaliland which support this kind of argument. A second kind of argument for institutional capacity comes from a set of arguments about colonialism. There were some forms of colonialism, um, especially Japan and in Korea and in Taiwan, which argue that the Japanese brought more modern forms of bureaucracy to these countries. Finally, there are arguments about religion, that there are internalized norms um, this is an argument which um, a sociologist that Yale has made that if you look at the Prussian bureaucracy and one thing that's striking about Prussia, it certainly developed very rapidly at, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century. And part of this was due to having Calvinists um, serving in the bureaucracy of Prussia itself. And Many of these were brought in by early Prussian rulers because they realized that these were people that would serve the state and serve the state loyally. So we have a bunch of arguments about where institutional capacity comes from and may come from external threats and may come from social coalitions and may come from external colonialism and may come from religion. And finally, it may come from having if you could if we go to the next slide, please, if we could go, it might come from having exceptional leaders. So if you look there, obviously the, um, the image of Lincoln is very familiar. Uh, the image on the top left, which Michael knows since we were there together, is an image of Genghis Khan, who was a ruler of Mongolia, who the Mongolians are sort of depicting as a law giver. The president on the bottom, you have someone, Anuhu Rabatu, who was the, um, the, basically the anti-corruption commissioner in Nigeria, and finally, the, um, the uh, ruler of Rwanda. So the question is, so these look like extraordinary people. Um, I knew Robato is someone from Yola, Nigeria. I actually served in, in Yola as a member of the Peace Corps. And he was exiled from Nigeria after, in about uh, 2012, uh, came, spent three years in the United States, gave a number of talks around the United States. Uh, one of the arguments that he made, which I found very impressive, was an argument said, look, when I was the anti-corruption commission in Nigeria, somebody came to me with basically a briefcase full of money. They put it down in front of me. They said, remove this commission. I took the briefcase and I took it to the anti-corruption commission and this person was prosecuted. And I found this argument to be very compelling. And I thought Duhu Rabata was very compelling as an example of someone who would really fight valiantly, even in a situation where there, he wasn't necessarily getting much support, until someone pointed out to me, you know, if these were American bills, the largest American bill is, I think, $100, you wouldn't be able to fit uh, multi-million dollars in a, brie in, a, in, a, in, a, in a briefcase. And that, so it wasn't exactly clear how this, this was actually delivered. But at any rate, I think if you go to the next slide, please, um, we do have these, these two big arguments about modernization theory and institutional capacity. I think a more recent theory that's developed um, mainly in the economy, mainly in the American economy, so I wouldn't say this is broad sway, um, is this theory of ra what I, a rational choice institutionalism, which I know is a, bit, is, a, is a lot to swallow, but it's basically a theory that talks about elite bargaining and competition. And it says that if you want to look at how states actually developed effective governments and governments that were also constrained, it was a function of decisions that were taken by elites. And these elites are engaged in strategic behavior. Uh, they try to anticipate what other people will do. They, have, they don't necessarily have the same interests. Um, political institutions ha here have to be effective, but they have to be constrained. They can't just be empowering. If they're em empowered and there's no constraint on them, which is what you have in Hobbes, um, people will be afraid that they will be simply overrun, trampled by institutions. So institutions have to be effective and they also have to be constrained. I mean, this is a theory that also says you can't necessarily make predictions in advance. 
So there is some element of path dependence here. There are random events which might have taken place a long time in the past. There's no necessary teleology. There's nothing that moves you from what rational choice institutional uh, approach is called a closed access order to an open access order. So if we could go to the next page, please. So if we look at path dependence, I mean, there's an argument, this is mainly made by uh, most of these are from Asimov and Robinson. So the Magna Carta in the 13th century, kind of accidental, Britain had a very, uh, the barons were always challenging the king. Um, you had a more independent peasantry in Europe, in England in the 14th century. If you look at the Black Death, it killed a quarter, maybe even up to 40% of the population of Britain, that may, of, of Europe, in, of, I'm sorry, of Europe in general. I mean, that made labor much more valuable. The question is, in some cases, that resulted in, so labor had more bargaining power. What did that mean? So in some cases, especially in Western Europe, including Britain, it meant that labor had more bargaining power. They had some degree of independence and they were able to use that bargaining power to get more independence. If you look at Eastern Europe, you have the beginnings of serfdom, labor did have more independence, people could run away. If they ran away, it was very bad. That led to higher levels of repression. If you look at the Glorious Revolution in, uh, in 1688 in Britain, Britain at the end of the 19th century. So the one thing that's clear, and this is pointed to by many theorists, is the beginning of the English state. Um, so the king did give up some power. So my question is, why was the king willing to give up some power? Well, one, Britain was threatened by France. So there was an external threat. This is war makes a state and the state makes war. So the king knew that he needed capital. If you look at the British budget in the 18th century, and Britain starts in say 1700, it's a smaller and weaker state than France. Ultimately in 1815, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars, Britain defeated France. So how did this happen? So one argument is that the British were able to, they were threatened by France. They realized that they needed a stronger navy. To get a stronger navy, they had to get capital. To, to get capital, they had to get money from the people that had the capital. That means they had to have some guarantees that the king would not simply give up on the loan and, and declare the loans as being invalid. If you did that, you, I mean, it was true that people like the Fuggers who were wealthy money lenders in Germany led money, led money to kings, but they lent money only at very high interest rate. Why did they charge high interest rate? Because they realized that the king could simply abrogate the loans and they'd be stuck. So if you look at Britain in the 19th century, uh, and you're thinking about this from the position of the king. One, you're, ex you're threatened by France. Two, you knew that your father was actually executed um, in 1649. Three, you knew that the British had tried with Cromwell and then Cromwell's son became the Lord Protector of England. That didn't work either. Um, so I think if you're looking at this, when the, if you're looking at why the British invited William and Mary to become the, the kings of England, and what you have is a situation um, which where if you were the king, you'd realize that things could really go badly. You could be overrun by France, you could be killed by your own, there could be an internal revolution. So you were willing to actually give up some power. So if you look at what happened in the 18th century in Britain, the king did, did give up power. He gave up this, he gave up the ability to arbitrarily cancel debts. Loans were only made through the Bank of England. The merchants had sound guarantees. They lend money at lower interest rates. The result was that Britain had a very powerful navy um, and ultimately a powerful army. If you look at what happened in the following centuries, in the following centuries, in the 18th and 19th century, the English middle class decided that, well, you know, we did these things in Britain. So it was private companies that fed the troops. It was private companies that made the forts. It was private companies that made the cannonballs. It was private companies that made the cannons. Something like what we have in the United States now, if you're looking at, at what we, we call the industrial military complex. So these were private actors. Um, they, they did all of these things. People were less worried about the king having arbitrary power. They were less willing, worried about having their money grabbed from them or even being killed. Um, and so you had the development of a state which was in England, which was both effective, but also constrained. Uh, so you had in, in the 19th century, you had industrial growth, you had, you had democracy, you had ultimately in Britain the, effect, the, the uh, development of an effective government. Now, I think a lot of this depended on fortuitous developments. For those of you that have seen the movie Dunkirk, which came out in, in 2019, um, 
imagine if the weather had been bad uh, in the English Channel when the British were trying to, to extract the British expeditionary force and about 100,000 French from the sands of Dunkirk. Uh, imagine that they had gotten stuck or that the Germans had used some other military tactic. The movie makes a case, and I actually, as far as I can tell from the historical, um, from, from trying to read some of the history of the period, the British would have sued for peace. Now, maybe the Germans would have lost World War II, but it clearly would have been very different than it turned out to be. So having good weather so that you could have small ships sail uh, in June of 1940 was very important for Britain and very important for not just the history of England or the history of Europe, or, but even for the history of mankind as a whole. So I think if you're thinking about rational trade institutionalism, it requires a certain set of events. And it's true that having the right structural conditions is very important, but it doesn't mean that the structural conditions are a guarantee and luck does play some role. All right, what's the implication of these different theories? If we go to the next slide, please. Um, it, none of these theories are, are, perfect, are perfect. So modernization theory doesn't explain why, I mean, why did you only have economic growth beginning in England and then the rest of Western Europe in the 19th century? If you look at technological change in population growth, that occurred in lots of places in the world, in the Roman Empire, in the Mayan Empire, in Egypt, in classical Greece. Uh, if you look at the Chinese Empire, certainly, you know, up until at least perhaps 1800, the Chinese had technological capacity which exceeded the te technological capacity of the West. So why do you only have growth at a particular time? And this is a huge, I think a huge problem for modernization theory. Why did you have economic growth taking place in first in England and then in Western Europe, then in North America in the 19th century, but not in other places? All right, if you look at other flaws and gaps, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, institutional capacity theory, I mean, the problem here is, you know, if people get lots of power, if you have lots of institutional capacity, why do they, why don't they use that power to feed themselves and their family or their supporters, the people that have guns and arrows? It might be true that North Korea would be better off if it had a democratic regime. Would, but would Kim Jong-un be better off? Probably not. Uh, if you look at rational choice institutionalism, I mean, I think there were two big problems. One is that, um, you know, there isn't a, sex, a systematic explanation for why, the, why countries make this jump from closed access order to open access order. There's no teleology in the theory. There's no necessary change. Uh, I think if you're relying on, truck and, uh, on luck and happenstance, that it isn't very clear when these changes will take place. And I think another problem with rational choice institutionalism, you have this, this sort of inclusive or exclusive world. I mean, there are two states that you can be in, whereas it's clear that there are clearly some countries that look like they're in the middle. So if we go to the, la the next slide, and I'll stop here, go to... Um, so the problem is this, if you look at what the OECD wants, it aims for good governance. I mean, it wants good governance. It wants good, it wants good governance, it wants elections, it wants the end of the corruption, wants free and fair elections, it wants democracy. These, if you're thinking about, if you think of rational choice institutionalism as the best way to look at, at why development has taken place, all of these aims are inconsistent with the aims of power elites in autocratic regimes. And under those circumstances, they're not likely to be accepted. I mean, if you recognize that the OECD is not the natural order of things, it implies that what we can do in developing countries is very limited. So let me, let me stop there and let me just say, if you're looking at, at poor countries that have strong institutional capacity like Russia and China, there isn't very much that we can do at all. If you're looking at countries that might be transitional like Brazil, um, we can do things, but only I think if the local government is going to assist us. So I, I listened to the CDDRL presentation yesterday, which was about the Arab world. And one of the recommendations that we should was that we should reach out and make connections with a broader range of actors within civil society, which is exactly the right recommendation. But I think it's very hard to figure out who those people might actually be. So I, I have to say, I thought in, in government, 
I had a number of conver conversations with people from Azerbaijan. I was very, very excited by something called the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. Uh, this was an initiative that, that was funded by Norway. It had multi-sector participation. So participation came from government, from civil society, from large corporations. And the basic idea was that if you made, um, made your revenues transparent, especially your revenues from extractive industries, you would likely get more honesty in government. So what happened with Azerbaijan? So Azerbaijan is a deeply corrupt country. Azerbaijani diplomats, Azeri diplomats speak excellent English. They know exactly what Americans want to hear. They were the first country to actually be certified by EITI. And it made no difference because they simply moved the corruption to someplace else. So I think the advice that the speaker yesterday was giving, which is it was somewhere from the Carnegie Foundation, which is that we should broaden our connection with civil society was exactly right. But I think it's extremely hard, extremely hard to figure out what's going on in other countries. And while there might be someone in the United States or Germany or the United Kingdom who has the right answers, getting those answers to the people that can actually make the decisions is very, very hard. I mean, when I was in Nigeria, this was in the early 1960s, about six months after I left, all of a sudden I was in Northern Nigeria, all of the Southern Nigerians were killed in the town that I was in. I have to say, I didn't see it coming. And the one lesson that I learned from that, it's really, really hard to figure out what's going on. So I think if you look at our opportunities for external state building, I think there are some things we should do. We should aim for good enough governance. We should aim for security. We should aim for improvements in health, which has been a big success story since the Second World War since I think improvements in health go along with improvements in the kind and support for autocratic rulers. And maybe we should look for some improvement in economic growth if that economic growth um, doesn't threaten the rent-seeking opportunities of autocratic rulers. But if you look at corruption, I think rather than having gross theft, we should try to have patronage. Don't try to get rid of all corruption because you won't succeed in doing that. So I think there is something that we can do. I think we can have good enough governance, but good enough governance doesn't mean consolidated democracy. It doesn't mean respect for all human rights. Um, it doesn't mean a lot of the things that we hope that our foreign policy would accomplish. But I think if you look at Afghanistan and Iraq or Vietnam before that, um, you know, they are the failures that we should look at closely. If you look at some of our successes like Germany and Japan, they came under very peculiar circumstances. And those circumstances were not necessarily that the rulers like the Emperor Hirohito in Japan were necessarily committed to democracy, but they thought they, they had a choice. I mean, one choice was throwing in their, their side with the, with the Americans, with MacArthur, which they did. And the other choice was, was becoming a communist country, which was already something that was happening in China, which they thought was very threatening. So, let me stop there and say that I think that our opportunities for change, we should aim for good enough governance, not for good governance. And that's the best that we can possibly hope for in most of the countries that we're dealing with. Okay, thank you very much, Steve. Um, if we were meeting in person, we'd all be clapping for you right now. So let me, uh, so if people have uh, questions, they should use the Q&A uh, box uh, to post them and I will, uh, get to them in a minute, but I want to uh, start off by asking you the following, where, which connects kind of the theoretical part of your talk to the practical part. Um, you can sort of sum up the practical policy uh, part of your book. And by the way, I've had the advantage, I've actually read the whole book, unlike other people here. Uh, but the practical implication, uh, uh, to put it bluntly, is we ought to support General Sisi in Egypt, right? That this Correct. is about as good as we can expect. And he's providing at least stability. Doesn't matter that he's violating human rights and he's corrupt and everything else, but, you know, stability should be uh, what we settle for. And, you know, I'm, I'm sympathetic with a lot of what you say because I, I think it's right that, you know, what I call getting to Denmark uh, is an extremely difficult thing that we don't understand. and and. You know, the Danes don't understand it and, and, you know, it's something very hard to do from the outside. But I guess it, it the, the question that I've got uh, is related to your theoretical construct because uh, 
the rational choice institutionalism that you prefer is a completely elite driven thing. I mean, it kind of assumes that the elites are in charge, they make bargains, and if things don't go according to their interests, they're simply not going to accept a different outcome. Uh, and I wonder whether that's an alternative to modernization theory or actually something that exists in parallel to modernization theory, because what modernization theory would say is that elites are not the whole game, that there's constant social change and social mobilization. So with industrialization, you get a working class, you get a bourgeoisie, the social structure of societies change. And you know, coming up from the bottom are all of these big new social forces that the elites now have to contend with. And if you then relate that to your policy prescription, when you're deciding to support someone like CC, how do you know that there actually isn't a huge amount of social change and social modernization going on, you know, underneath the surface, and that this elite dictator is just sitting on that, and that at a certain point it's just all going to come exploding out, and you're going to be in a worse position? I mean, it's kind of what happened with the Shah of Iran, which was a prior dictator that we thought would provide stability, or even Sisi's predecessor, Mubarak, who it turned out was sitting on all of these young Egyptians who had very, very different, you know, aspirations. I mean, isn't it possible that both, both of these theory, you know, that modernization still tells you a lot that there's something other than these elite bargains that you have to pay attention to, uh, and that that would then affect, you know, your judgment about whether it's appropriate to support someone like a Sisi? Yeah, so Frank, I, I should have, I realized that it's exactly the right question. And I don't, have a, I don't have a compelling answer to it. So I would say two things. One is, and the problem with CC is, you know, to be effective, you have to be inclusive. Is CC inclusive enough? I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, Mubarak looked like he was inclusive enough, but he wasn't, but it could be tell. But I think the larger question is, you know, thinking about the role of elites versus the role of, you know, these larger social forces that might come up from the bottom. And I don't have a good answer for that. I've thought about this question. So that there are some examples where, you know, like Mao, you know, if we look at the 20th century, you had these very powerful individuals and they, you know, people followed them. I mean, I, I remember watching some film about World War II and there were these American soldiers who were from Italy or Germany. Well, what if they, what if their forebearers had actually stayed in Italy or Germany? I think they'd just be fascist. But I think it's exactly the right question. So the way, you know, even if you look at contemporary America, you know, one of the things that's been, I mean, for me anyway, troubling is if you look at the reaction to COVID-19, you get big differences between Republicans and Democrats, which does support the notion that you know, leaders have a really powerful role, but I think it's exactly the right question. I mean, you know, are there social forces which leaders have to compromise with, can effectively control or not? There's no choice. Rational choice institutionalism puts a lot of weight on leaders, and the implication of that argument is that the leaders have, uh, you know, can steer these social forces in directions that they please. I know that's where I'm coming down, and I also know that I don't have good evidence for making that assertion. <laughs> Okay, uh, actually there are two questions, one by Mike McFall uh, and another one that are actually both related to China. Uh, are there implications of your argument for, well, actually Mike asked for Chinese foreign policy about you know, how the Chinese are going to use Belt and Road and you know, aid and so forth. Um, and then the second one is a slightly different emphasis. What would it mean for US-China uh, relations? Um. All right, so I listen, actually, let me start with the second question because it's somewhat easier. Um, so I listened to Tom Finger yesterday, who was on one of, one of our webcasts, um, making an argument that we're mainly interested in security. But I think, you know, if you look at American foreign policy from Nixon through Obama, I mean, yes, you know, we're interested in, in, in security issues, we're interested in China, at least not oppose, you know, be being being with us rather than against us and opposing the Soviet Union. But it's also true that we thought China would become wealthy. It became it became it would become wealthy, it would become 
you'd get a larger middle class, or to get a larger middle class would be democratic, and the Chinese would end, the, end up being just like us. You know, I don't think we wanted to say those things out loud, but I think that's what our aspiration would have been. And there was no reason why political leaders should have said those things out loud. It just would have scared the Chinese leadership. So I think um, if you look at China, I mean, what's happening is that China has become wealthy and lo and behold, they just remain Chinese. They didn't become just like us. So if we think about possible futures for China, I think they, ha you know, assuming they have a very autocratic regime now, all right, I think they're most likely to stall out. I don't think they'll become wealthy. That's what the theory would say. You have an arbitrary state, the state has a lot of power, um, people be worried about the state and they'll take their money and they'll put their money in real estate in Palo Alto rather than putting their money in China. Um, so rational trace institutionalism would say, yes, the Chinese, they might get to the point of being middle class, which they have gotten, but that's as far as they'll get. And they, they've sort of taken advantage now of moving people from the countryside to cities. They've taken advantage of technology, which has already been proved in other countries. And they won't get further than that. That's I know that's a clear prediction. So okay. I think if you believe in rational choice institutionalism, that's where you put your money. Um, if you think about the first question, I mean, what is implied for Chinese foreign policy? So I think the problem is that it makes China China looks very attractive to a lot of autocratic countries around the world. Um, and getting money for the Belt and Road Initiative looks very attractive. Now. The problem is, and, and I don't know enough about this topic, I mean, are you reaching a point where people see China as a threat? Um, you know, so if the Chinese take over a port in Sri Lanka, rather than simply financing a port in Sri Lanka, how threatening will that be to the Sri Lankan government? But I think there is a real big problem for us, which is that we followed a good government foreign policy, which is threatening to a lot of autocratic elites. And there are a lot of countries which are autocratic, probably 130 out of 200. And China will provide a model which is much easier for them. So that's a huge problem, I think a huge problem for us. Mm -hmm. OK, uh, John Farajan asks, uh, in your summary of modernization theory, you admitted that uh, Jaworski's generalization seems to be true. That is to say, as countries get richer, they seem to not revert to authoritarian governments. So isn't that a guide for policy, if that generalization is actually correct? No, I think that generalization is correct. Um, not quite as inevitable as Jaworski might have thought. So if you look at, at um, you, know, more, you know, some more recent work that's more thorough, I mean, it, it hold, but it does hold up very well, except for the Cold War period when the Soviet Union clearly wasn't interested in democracy and that we might have mouthed off about democracy, but we didn't do much to necessarily support it. The problem I think is that countries become wealthier, but they don't necessarily, you know, if they make the transition, it's great. But if they don't make the transition, you can be in a, you know, they can just stay autocratic. So there's no guarantee that the Chinese are going to become democratic. No guarantee that and we can look at Singapore, which is a very wealthy country, wealthier than the US, will become a consolidated democracy. So I think, yes, there's strong empirical support for modernization theory. And when I said, yeah, you, you need the right structural conditions. So it's better if you're wealthy than if you're poor, but not, a, not an absolute guarantee. OK, uh, there's another question about, so if, um, Going up the economic escalator uh, implies under modernization theory more democracy. If a country like the United States falls back down the escalator and stalls out, uh, does that also mean that it could go backwards in terms of uh, democracy <laughs> and political institutions? So I, I think we should, all, we should all be somewhat worried. Um, and I think this supports Frank's original intervention about the dynamism of the the social system itself. So what you've had in the United States, so I recently read a book by uh, Case and Deaton about, I think it's called Deaths of Despair. So life expectancy in the United States of, of whites that don't have a college education has actually declined. There's no precedent for that in the industrialized world except for the Soviet Union in the 1970s and 1980s. That's a very alarming figure. Um, so you look, you're looking, but I think, so yes, I, I think countries could fall down. So I think the United States could possibly fall down and we should be 
weren't. Um, you know, I think you, you created a large class of individuals who, you know, have not been well served by the existing system. If you look at the last 40 years, these, you know, a lot of people haven't had, their incomes have simply fallen. And, you know, all the familiar um, uh, reasons why the United States hasn't done very well. Um, if you look at this sort of mystery in the United States is that we don't have an adequate policy for how we might serve those people. We are expected to come from the Democratic Party. It hasn't come from the Democratic Party yet. Okay, um, let's see. Yeah, there's a couple of questions that are kind of related to backsliding, but I think you've answered that. Um, so Tom can Finger I, can asked- I just add one thing? Yeah. So, yeah, we could backslide, but if we do backslide and we slide back down, it doesn't, uh, you know, we could back, we could slide back down into a sort of chaotic situation. It doesn't mean that you'll slide back down, pick yourself up, get on the escalator again and start going up. It might happen, but it might not. Okay, uh, so this is a question from Tom Finger. What forms of support for autocrats might lead to better governance or is evidence of good enough governance a prerequisite for support? Yeah, so I think the, the thing about good enough governance is it's something that you might be able to accomplish. You might be able to get greater security. You might be able to get some economic growth. You can surely can get better health. Um, those, and this is where it, it relates to sort of, the, there is a relationship between modernization theory if you're thinking about institutional capacity. So if you got those things, you would be in a better position than you would be in otherwise. And it's more likely that you'd actually have a democratic regime, but it's not guaranteed. And I think that's been our frustrations. So I think we've pushed for some things which we should not have pushed for. Getting rid of all corruption in Afghanistan was I think impossible. Getting rid of some corruption, the worst form of corruption like stealing $800 billion from the Bank of Kabul and putting it in Dubai, um, as opposed to working for patronageism is something that we could have actually accomplished. Um, we would have been better off aiming, aiming more modestly and then hoping that circumstances would come together in a way that would get us to the transition where we would get democratic regimes. Yeah, so good enough governance is not a prerequisite for supporting somebody. It's actually an aspiration and you're saying that you shouldn't aim higher than that necessarily. I, I think it, we, we aim higher for that. It's not just that we can't accomplish higher. If we're thinking about good government, but we actually might make things worse. So better to think about elections and autocratic regimes as agreements among elites, rather than aiming for free and fair elections. Better to think of patronage is better than gross theft if you're thinking about corruption, but don't think you can get rid of all corruption. If you aim to eliminate all corruption, you may make things actually worse than you would. So good enough governance is no guarantee that you're gonna get a transition to democracy, but it's right to say that it does create conditions where it makes democracy more likely. Okay, there's a question. Uh, US has a history of aspirationally not having diplomatic relations with states. It's offended by PRC, DPRK, Cuba. Uh, what are your thoughts on the efficacy of that? I guess maybe one way to slightly reinterpret that question is you seem to be moving towards a basically a real pretty realist view of foreign policy that we ought to consider national interests, stability, security, you know, as what we uh, seek rather than a values-based foreign policy. And if that's the case, shouldn't that affect, you know, countries that are ideologically you know, hostile and maybe imply uh, that we need better relations with them. So the, the short answer to that is yes. I think the, the problem is, I mean, you know, if you, and Bush in, in some ways, Trump, I mean, provide very nice bookends for I think what have been the two extremes in American foreign policy. We either tried to make everyone just like us, which was Bush, uh, or we've tried to, we viewed the rest of the world as sinful and we've thought about America first. And the problem in the contemporary environment is that you have a situation in which relatively weak actors, sometimes state actors, sometimes non-state actors, could secure resources. They could be nuclear weapons. I mean, Steve Cole in his book about um, uh, the ISI in Pakistan has a very alarming story about in 2014, a couple of Pakistani naval officers tried to smuggle nuclear weapons aboard a Pakistani ship that was in the Indian Ocean. 
you could have cyber attacks. You could have, if you think about um, about bioengineering, I mean, we, you know, COVID nineteen was was bad, but it could have been much worse. You could have had a much higher death rate if you and you could engineer a a pathogen with a much higher death rate, and it's becoming more and more and more available for individuals with maybe an MA or maybe even a good BA to buy CRISPR, which costs less than $500 now on the web. You can check it out on Amazon to create a pathogen so that very weak actors, either state actors like North Korea or non-state actors like jihadists, I mean, could create a weapon which could kill thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of Americans. Could cause a level of death which is closer to the level that we've associated with war than the level that we've associated with attacks by other actors. So if you, you know, as long as people just had swords or even had guns or even with a dynamite, maybe they could kill 100 people. So anarchists, I mean, killed a lot of political leaders around 1900. Uh, you could throw off a stick of dynamite in a French theater, you could kill scores of people. But we're now in a situation where relatively weak actors can get millions of people. So the short answer is yes, I think we ought to, we ought to think about, if we're thinking about Cuba, I think it would be better if we had decent relationships with Cuba, um, if we provided the Cubans with some rewards. But don't think that we're going to be able to transform Cuba into just like us. OK, uh, so this is a question. I think you've probably gotten a version of it repeatedly. So. Uh, what should the international uh, and domestic enforcement of your proposed yardstick of good enough governance actually look like? So what, what does good enough governance, governance mean? What is good enough? At what point yeah, do you say, so okay, that's... That's... Right. Well, that's a question. I should have given more thought to that than I have. So let me start off with that, that confession. So at a minimum, it means having security within your own border. So you should be able to police your own territory. Um, I think it's easy to think about that, you know, improving people's health, since if you look at life expectancy, even in relatively poor countries like Bangladesh, it's close to 70 years. That's worked very well in the post-World War II period. I think it's worked well because it didn't create a threat to autocratic leaders. But even some health initiatives, like uh, we succeeded in wiping out smallpox, at least for the time being, but even polio has encountered resistance in northern Nigeria and certainly in Pakistan, it's ongoing, uh, so that even health is not guaranteed. So I do think it's right that, you know, you should encourage some economic growth. So if you see a country simply stagnating, if you see a country that's chaotic, if you look at southern Sudan, for instance, I mean, that's not a good outcome for us. If you see a country where you do have an effective government and you do have some economic growth, that would be good enough governance don't ask for full protection of human rights. You know, so if you look, I mean, I was in Afghanistan, I think in 2011, and one of the top priorities of all the aid agencies from the United States, Australia, Canada, the, U, uh, the European Union was to promote human rights. Well, I think that's great, was to promote women's rights. So I think that's great. Um, it would be great if we could do it, but it's very hard to do in a, in a country where people, don't care very much about women's rights. I mean, they have cared about points in the, in the, at points in the past, but they don't care very much now. So that if you look at the creation of sports teams in Afghanistan, which has resulted, at least according to New York Times reporting, of some individuals being, um, some individual women on these teams being abused by their own coaches, that's a bad outcome. So it isn't to say that we can't be aspirational, but we should keep our aspirations in check and the key, I think, is to make sure that if you do have aspirations, make sure that your aspirations are ones that are shared by autocratic rulers in most of the countries in the world. So we can't do some, some things, but trying to do too much gets us into trouble. Okay, well, this is actually a, more of a comment from Eric Jensen, but it relates to that answer that you just gave. So everyone thought that Suharto in Indonesia was good enough until he wasn't in the wake of the 1997 Asian financial crisis. Uh, success of the Asian Counter-Corruption Commission is a story of a broad mobilization of civil society uh, constituencies that the elite bargain wouldn't have sustained. So how do you answer that? Like, wouldn't you have said in 1967, yeah, he's good enough, he's stable, you know, Indonesia's growing great, so you know, let's not rock the boat. 
All right, so the answer is yes, I confess. I would have said it was good enough, um, even past 1967. So the problem I think is, and I don't think Eric is wrong to say that, I mean, we have had some successes, but we've also had a lot of failures. And I think the root cause of that is it's really hard to figure out who you should bet on. So, and if you think about CDDRL, we have our summer fellows. Are we confident that we know who we can bet on in Ukraine or in Indonesia or in Egypt? I think it's really hard to do. So all I would say is that I don't see anything wrong with making those bets. They're not necessarily very expensive, but don't, don't you know, you make those bets, recognize that maybe those bets will pay off, maybe they won't. If they do pay, they might pay off, but it will depend on, I think to some extent on luck and betting on the right horses. And that's, it's, it's, the luck is a noble and betting on the right horses is very difficult to do. Okay, uh, well, it's interesting. There's actually three different questions which all seem to be coming from uh, people from Turkey, including our Aicha uh, Elam Daralu. Uh, so, I guess the general issue is, you know, how do you explain what's going on in, in Turkey right now? Because they've had a huge amount of economic growth under Erdogan, uh, and yet the country is becoming much more uh, autocratic. So I guess from a couple of different, you know, perspectives, I mean, what explains, you know, the direction that they've been moving in? And I suppose, what does that say in terms of our foreign policy about how we ought to relate to that phenomenon? Yeah, so I think the problem is this. So I think if you look at, so I don't have a great answer. So it's more of a problem for modernization theory than it would be for rational choice institutionalism. But I think the problem in Turkey is this. So you've got you've gotten this leader in Turkey, Erdogan, who's not particularly committed to dem democracy. You've had a lot of economic growth. Erdogan is dependent, you know, mainly on people who live someplace away from the coast. But there are also a lot of people living on the coast of Turkey, um, in the Mediterranean, the Aegean, and the Black Sea that we we could that are in favor of a more democratic system so i don't want to say that if we look at turkey that it's impossible but i would the only thing i would say about turkey is you know we'd have to figure out who we want to bet on we'd have to bet on them and we'd have to recognize that you know our information is inevitably going to be limited because you know people you know, there will be a lot of people that will speak actual English. There will be a lot of people that know exactly what Americans want to hear. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be the people that we should bet on. So I think that we, we, you know, we can make some bets in Turkey, but you see in Turkey how hard it is to, you know, to have a government that reaches what Madison and in the Federalist 51 call a sweet spot, you know, where the government is effective and it's also constrained. So it looked like like Erdogan was great and it looked like Turkey was on exactly the right path, um, you know, until it wasn't. So I think we should make these bets, but recognize that you have to make the bets over the long term and recognize they will also often be betting on the wrong horse because it's hard to figure out what's going on in these places. Okay, well, it's uh, one o'clock, but let me try to sneak in two questions at once, one from Jim Furon and the other from Maiko Ichihara. So, Jim wants to know why you want to make love to despots if they are personalistic rulers. Uh, isn't that uh, in itself uh, uh, a danger? And why should we uh, get into bed uh, with them as opposed to, I don't know, just holding hands or something? And uh, Michael's question is, isn't this going to, isn't this kind of policy of supporting good enough governance uh, basically just going to legitimize illiberal governance uh, in uh, different countries. All right, so let me answer the first question first. So I, I have to admit, if I were, the, the, the title wasn't mine, so I think Jim is absolutely right. So maybe holding hands with us would have been a better title, but I, you know, I can, I sort of, this is a problem. I mean, one should recognize with going with the commercial publisher, they're trying to sell books. And I guess they thought that how to make love to despots was better than holding hands with, how to hold hands with despots. Although I agree that holding hands would have been a better title for the book. Um, if we're thinking about legitimating these regimes, yeah, it's, it's true, it's not so great, but we haven't had very great success otherwise. So, I mean, if you look at, you know, Vietnam, Afghanistan, Iraq, I mean, what's been the result of that? We didn't try to make love with despots. We, you know, I think that the Bush administration, which I, granted I worked under, 
I mean, was, you know, I think was Bush was absolutely sincere in trying to make these into democratic regimes, and he utterly and completely failed. So I think it's right that, you know, if we hold hands with despots, we will to some extent legitimate them, but I don't think, you know, I, I, I don't think we have a good choice except to do that. Okay, with that, uh, we're out of time. So, th uh, Steve, thank you very much for that presentation and for a really fascinating discussion. Uh, when is the book going to be on sale? I think May 4th. They have it down for now. I thought it was April, but now they're saying Okay, May. well, I can't tell everybody to rush out to the bookstore and pick up a copy, but maybe you can pick one up I'm on a, Amazon. Amazon so. will have it. Yeah, okay. All okay, right, thank well, thank you. you very much. Thanks, Until next Frank. week. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.